Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about the role financial advisors can play in helping their clients through one of the most consequential periods of their lives. While many clients first engage with advisors to prepare for retirement, conversations must eventually turn to how assets can be protected and distributed during and after a client's final years. Transfer of wealth can be complex, particularly for ultra high net worth clients, and they're often complicated estates. However, this process can present an important opportunity for advisors as well. A 2024 study by Mass Mutual found that 62% of high net worth advisors see their clients' children as a key growth opportunity. When handled effectively, advisors can play a critical role in transitioning both the management of assets and the overall relationship from their clients to their clients' children. Today, we're going to talk about the important role advisors can play as a trusted point person for their clients and their families. Joining me to share their insights are three experts on the subject. Mike O'Connor joins us from Mass Mutual, where he is head of private wealth and trust. Hi, Mike. Hey, John. Great to be here. Thanks for being with us. We're also joined today by two financial advisors. Cheryl Holland is the founder of Abacus Planning Group in South Carolina. Hi, Cheryl. Good afternoon. Good to be here. Great. And Todd McDonald is a founding partner of Broadstone Advisors in New York. Thanks for being with us, Todd. Thanks, Sean. All right. So uh, let's get started. Um, I think uh, probably the ideal place for us to begin here and, and the most important thing for us to do to start off is to understand the scope of the great wealth transfer. This is a concept that we've been talking about and hearing about uh, for years. Um, but where are we right now? So, so Mike, I'm going to turn this over to you. Where are we? Ha has the great wealth transfer begun? H help us sort this out. Sure. It, it has most definitely begun, John. And it really started back in 2011 when the first baby boomers started to retire. And we've gotten to a point now where 10,000 Americans are retiring every single day. Looking at that same period from today back to 2011, the U.S. population has grown 9% since 2011, yet the ultra-high net worth population has grown 354%, and the high net worth population has grown over 200%. There has been a significant, unprecedented consolidation of wealth in the market that far outpaces the natural growth of this country, and this is where the opportunity lies. I think all of us see Cerulean's report every year, and every year they put a number on there in terms of the amount of wealth that is going to transition over the next 15 years or so. Just two years ago, it was in the $60 trillion amount. Last year, it was in the $70 trillion amount. And this year, now they're projecting $80 trillion plus. And what that really says is that not only is the transition of wealth happening from one generation to the other, but with this consolidation of wealth that continues to occur in our country, the stockpile of wealth is growing greater than ever. And so we are now looking at over $80 trillion in wealth be transitioned. There is a need for financial advisors to help provide transition solutions at, at this point in time. And there's a need now more than ever before for financial advisors to build relationships with the recipients of that great amount of wealth. So this is the perfect time for a conversation. Thanks, Mike. Um, and uh, well, let's let's talk to our financial advisors. Um, you know, Cheryl, I'll go to you first. You know, as uh, you know, as this baby boomer generation has reached retirement, has it impacted your practice? You know, particularly you know, as Mike was talking about over the over the past five, ten years. Yeah, to piggyback on what Mike said, I will say I've noticed three big trends among many others. But first of all, baby boomers is a pretty long, long cohort in terms of number of decades that they represent, not just the number of them. So we've seen people change from not can I retire because of this wealth accumulation to how do I best retire? And that means not only technical strategies to minimize taxes during that those years and make sure their money lasts long enough, but also what does that mean? mean to be retired. That whole conversation has changed. 
The second thing we've noticed is we've had to get much savvier about the aging process. The idea that people are living longer, but comes with a lot of challenging issues. Dementia, how does a spouse care for another spouse who's not doing well? All those complicated soft issues that go along with aging. And then the third biggest trend we found is, hey, you know what, I'm okay, but you as my financial advisor, make sure I want you to make sure my kids are okay. And sometimes they're parents. So there's been a generational shift for people coming not as a couple, but as a family. And they want the advisor to make sure that the kids are okay, not just that themselves. And Todd, what are you seeing? Yeah, actually a fairly significant terms of uh, how we give advice today than even how we give advice 15 years ago, uh, partially because of age in the, the even referencing the, um, you know, the figures that Mike gave earlier. Uh, just to set the stage, our practice is limited only to uh, providing advice to family owned and closely held businesses and a handful of uh, ESOPs and place stock ownership uh, plans in the world of construction. So um, think about age and liquidity. Um, today's 60 year olds were 15 year ago, uh, 45 year olds, and they were less concerned about transition, gifting, transferring their wealth, both liquid and illiquid uh, assets as well. Uh, just in the last six months, we've onboarded three or four new clients that are uh, that range in age between 59 and 62. So they're at that age that they're realizing that they really need to accelerate uh, their gifting strategies and their transition strategies. And also uh, to certainly back up what Cheryl said, um, how, how, do, how are they going to approach their retirement to produce income? And what is it that they actually want to do in retirement instead of um, just cease to do what they used to do? They have to have a plan going forward. So a lot, lot more attention and focus on that relevance in summary in terms of a sense of purpose, if we will, going forward. Sure. And, and Todd, so um, in a most typical situation, in an ideal situation with a client, when are you beginning to have uh, the, those conversations about, you know, the, the transfer of wealth plans and, and the gifting and everything you've just alluded to? As soon as possible. And that's defined as um, when a client's ready to have that conversation. So if we ask those questions regarding the transfer of wealth, both liquid and illiquid assets, um, it's not a question, for, of course, for us to answer. It's a question for us to pose on uh, when a couple feels comfortable. Ideally, uh, if we look at the next generation, if it's a family owned business or just the next generation of inherited wealth, if you will, um, when they're responsible to understand how finances work, um, with a little bit of a caveat, on occasion, may find this shocking. However, uh, mom and dad sometimes say, well, you know, we, we want to give them a little bit of money to test this out. Is the time ready? And we usually paint the picture. Well, if we don't test them out and there's a little amount of money, or responsibility, what happens when something happens to both of you and there's a lot more. So my answer to your question, John, is as soon as humanly possible when all parties are open to the idea of effective communication. Sure. Cheryl, what, uh, how do you handle it? I completely agree that you want to have, I mean, the very first year clients are with us, we always tackle the issue. And if they're not comfortable talking about um, wealth with their children, whether it's actually transferring assets or sharing information, we want to understand why. Is there a problem in the system? Is there drugs or alcohol? Is there concerns about decision-making capabilities? What is it would be a prevention or an obstacle to wealth transfer? So we understand very early on how to help the client craft that strategy unique to them. But we really encourage that dialogue among generations around wealth and the transfer of it when it's appropriate and timely. And um, children are going to make mistakes. We, we've made them. right, And so that's OK. We want to frame all these things as typical and normalize these conversations for clients to have with their family. It's a great gift that we bring. The second thing I say very briefly is sometimes clients say to us, what do you think? So there's a they, they trust you to give advice around these issues, not just come with their own opinions. Sure. 
Sure. I mean, you, you've been through this how many times before and, and they haven't. So that, that makes sense. That's, that's exactly right. So, Mike, um, you know, get, getting really getting into the heart of, uh, of our conversation today um, and the role that advisors can play working in sometimes, you know, complex situations. Um, we, we know that all this planning is not limited just to the financial advisor. Clients are going to have these conversations about transfer of wealth uh, with their tax accountants, with their attorneys as well. You know, certainly estate planning is going to involve that. Um, and, and I know that you have you know perspectives about how you know the role that advisors can play and how they can be leaders in this process. And I know that, that Mass Mutual um, offers resources. So, so can you tell us about that and and, and how Mass Mutual is helping its advisors serve their clients during during this process? Yeah, when you're thinking about wealth transition, quite often, logically, you're dealing with high net worth clients. And with a high net worth clients, the asset pool is significantly more complex. You're not talking just stocks and bonds. You're often talking about real estate, the liquidation of a business or other unique assets, including oil, gas, and mineral rights. And so it's a higher level of complexity from the start. Then you layer in this additional level of complexity around state and federal estate tax thresholds and the implications and the, and the tax burdens in each of the respective areas. And so you really need to understand that this is a slightly different than a normal conversation. Our purpose at Mass Mutual is pretty clear. We just seek to take what we think is inherently complex and simplify it for advisors and clients. And we do that in three fundamental ways. The first is by providing the necessary estate, tax, and trust expertise uh, and to build that as an extension of the advisor's office, very rarely does the financial advisor have the capabilities in their office to provide this level of expertise. And so our role as a private wealth and trust provider is to really extend that advisor's office to top-notch expertise in this estate tax and trust planning area. It's also to provide really top of the top top of the market investment counsel and expertise. And we do that by building portfolios, by taking the fiduciary accountability off the shoulders of the advisor so they can focus more on building the relationship with their client and their client's children. And us, Mass Mutual Trust, will take on the fiduciary and the investment accountability, taking significant workload off the plate of the advisor. Then finally, uh, which I think is at the core of this market, is around offering concierge level family office services. And this is what really what we're talking about here, the ability to sit with an advisor and the, their advisor's client with their family and to have a really meaningful conversation around how the wealth will be transitioned from one generation to the other. Perhaps the biggest area of training we do in, in our business is around holding these family office meetings. It's not a natural thing sometimes within a family to talk about money. And so we know it's our role to help a our affiliated financial advisors to be able to navigate those, to have the conversation earlier, as Todd pointed out a few seconds ago, uh, so that they're in a position to do that. And again, the objective here is not to act in any type of way uh, removed from our financial advisors, but really to operate as an extension of their office. So for the client's end, all these pieces are correct. That, that's great, Mike. And we're uh, we're definitely going to get back to the, uh, the, the the conversations with the rest of the family because I think that's a really important part of this. Um, but first, um, Cheryl, I, I just wanted your perspective. You know, the the idea of financial advisors, you know, taking the lead in, in all of this, as Mike was talking about. Um, wh why do you think that's important? Well, I think that's a great question, and maybe lead from behind. This is this is where you're leading from behind, right? You know, and because you're jockeying a lot of um, personalities and extra areas of expertise between the estate planning attorney and the trust officer, all those areas. But I say three reasons. One, we're generalists. So one of our biggest gifts is we know what we don't know. So we know when to bring in other people to do what they know best. The second is that we know the client extraordinarily well, and I don't just mean their financial statement, which we're gonna know well and who owns what entities, but we also know their values. So they get sort of driven down an area or a decision that we know doesn't match what we know them, we can pull that back and reframe the question to help them out. And then finally, we're terrific executors. 
you can have the best plan in the world, but if the beneficiary designation doesn't match what needs to happen, and if everything's not retitled in the revocable trust, all the, and not looked at occasionally, then it's not going to happen. So because we can lead a collaborative effort as generalists, secondly, we know our clients best, and finally, if it's not executed, and I don't just mean sign your name, everything done that has to be done to make the plan effective, um, you know, reminding the attorney to do the, the, the tax attorney or the CPA to do the gift tax return. All those things have to happen. That's why I think we're the best to lead the process. That makes and sense. We're, and we're comfortable talking about death, you know? We don't mind <laughs> saying, let's go over. We're going to die. Let's talk about it. <laughs> that, that's true. That's true. Todd, um, What's been uh, what's been your experience? Do you, do you agree that one? Do you agree that that it makes sense for for the FA to to take the lead here? And have you ever had a situation where you know maybe one of those other professionals separately wanted to take the lead and, and you had to kind of jockey for position? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a very insightful question. Um, I've got a few specific responses to your question. Uh, first and foremost, personalities, those of us that are financial advisors, um, we all have to come to our relationships or offer the resources that verify we're competent at what we do, if not very competent in our discipline, number one. Um, it's been my experience that most CPAs and attorneys um, their personalities are somewhat similar, but we're much more outgoing, I think, as a, as a practice, if you will, as an industry and a profession. And that leads us to time. Um, CPAs have uh, prescribed periods of time throughout the year that they're very busy. Um, attorneys, uh, they're generally doing yeoman's work to a large degree, you know, preparing documents, addressing issues. So they're just not focused on the same things that we as the financial planning and advisory community are. Time and, and you know, the gift of personality as well. So uh, it's verified uh, by the fact that if we come up with an idea in our practice, we test it, we beta test it just to see if it makes sense. When clients verify and take our lead that in fact they like by their preference of engagement as fiduciaries, fee-based planning advisors, when they write us checks, when they show up to meetings, that's verification on an annualized basis that they trust our opinion as an industry. And lastly, to your point, um, we have not surprisingly found that we've had to jockey for position with uh, attorneys or accountants. And sometimes we bring additional resources to bear uh, such as uh, we have a clinical uh, psychologist on retainer that is also available to, to uh, speak with our clients. So, and I, and I think it's because of the uh, personality and the time side. Um, the other two professions are always busy doing something. So therefore it leaves that vacuum of opportunity for us to fill. And proudly, I think folks like Cheryl and, and uh, our firm fill that for our clients. Thanks, Todd. Um... That makes sense. I, I question that, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to ask Cheryl first, but I'd really love to hear uh, Mike and, and, and you, Todd, um, weigh in on this as well. I, I'm curious because we, you know, as Cheryl mentioned, you all have different expertise and certainly there is something to recognizing that the tax accountant or the attorney has different expertise than you have. But how much do you need to know about what they do? to effectively lead this process. Uh, Cheryl, I'm gonna to go to you first, but I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts on it. Yeah, well, I think a good financial advisor must constantly seek mastery. And one of the reasons we always go with our clients to the attorney meeting is we're gonna learn in that meeting things that we didn't know about their area of expertise when they come in. So all of us need to, if not having our certified financial planning designation, which gives you an introduction to all of this, figure out ways to have some level of mastery in all of these areas, because you can get yourself in trouble, you can get yourself, your clients in trouble, if you don't have a working knowledge of how all of these areas work and relate to another, particularly with the ultra high net worth clients. That's a, I mean, Todd mentioned these ops. That's a very niche area. He's got to have great expertise in that to even work effectively with the other partners. So if you're not someone who you have to be curious about people and um, knowledge, I think to be a good advisor. 
I don't know what you would say to that. Todd, what, what do you think? Yeah, uh, completely agree. There's an awful lot to learn. And um, my observation is clients do not necessarily expect us to be all things to them. However, right. have access to the right resources to bring to bear. And back to your further, your earlier question, John, of, of jockeying for position, right? Or are we, we as, a, as an industry and community uniquely positioned? And again, the answer is yes, because of the fact that um, if we have a natural desire to be inquisitive, we learn an awful lot about business valuations, right? We engage similar to with our relationship very closely with um, Mike O'Connor and, and uh, his group over at Mass Mutual that uh, they will bring chartered financial analysts to bear to participate and complement in the conversation and other resources that other individuals have in their firm affiliation as well. Um, I should probably participate jokingly in another uh, session that um, keeps me away from working on Saturdays and Sunday mornings at 530 because of Cheryl's comment about uh, being a master, you know, at, at, at the audience that we uh, we hold. Um, and, and the higher up the proverbial wealth chain that we work from affluent you know, to you know, mass affluent to affluent to high net worth to ultra high net worth, the the tip of the spear narrows with regard to how resourceful we are. The further and higher we ascend, so ultra net worth individuals expect us to have resources that will help them, and they would recognize that immediately. Sure, that yeah. makes sense, yeah. Mike. Yeah, I'll go in. Actually, it's great to hear uh, Cheryl and Todd talk about what they need for expertise. Uh, and, and I'll answer your question in terms of what we expect of Cheryl and Todd and other financial advisors of expertise. And that centers around this covenant they have with their clients, this trust that they built, relationship that they've strengthened. And what that trust allows an advisor to extend their office to provide experts. If they don't have this tight bond with their clients, I'm not sure the clients really um, we'll, we'll, we'll regard highly any type of recommendation or any type of expert that's been brought to the table. So we feel like the advisor, the best advisors in this space are the ones that are developing strong relationships at, at not only the parent level, but at the children level, and that they focus their practice around accumulating relationships, whether that's organic through one family or whether that's through new relationships after new relationships. And I think that's where the model works. When I talked earlier about the size of the wealth that's going to be transitioned, that stockpile of dollars, when I talked a little about the consolidation at the highest end of the market in terms of high net worth alternative families, it's around, it's around relationships. And I often say, you build a relationship, financial advisor, and we'll take it from here. We'll handle the service piece of it. We will handle the investment piece and take that burden off your shoulders. But we will take the fiduciary oversight and help guide you and your clients in the estate planning uh, and trust journey. Uh, but trust, we can do that. Leverage what you're great at, which is building that relationship. That's great. Thank you, Mike. Um, I, uh, I do want to very quickly remind our audience that um, you can send in your questions to us and we will try to uh, get to as many of them as possible uh, in the time that we have. Um, we do have one question in so far that I do want to uh, very briefly throw out to, uh, to our panel. I'm not sure if anyone's necessarily going to have much of an answer for it, but someone wanted to know about different generations because we've been very focused on the idea of uh, of talking about you know the, the great wealth transfer and the baby boomers but certainly as Todd said we want you want to start having these conversations with your clients as early as possible and I'm sure some of those clients are a little bit younger a little bit earlier in their careers I'm wondering if any of the three of you have any thoughts just on are those conversations different is it, it are the younger generations the Gen Z, even the uh, the Gen X, Millennial, I'm not going in the right order. <laughs> are, are any of them? Uh, any of them have different perspectives that are that are worth noting and calling out? Um, you know, when, when talking about these these sorts of conversations. 
I would just say, I, from my perspective, I mean, we do have, and I'm sure everyone on the on the webinar does. We definitely, I definitely work with clients from 20, from 18 all the way to 92. 98 now, maybe one, two, other one. And I would say the only difference I notice is communication methodologies. You know, they tend to prefer the tax, which has some SEC regulations. They're just a little bit more different how you get in touch with them, how you find them, what time of day they're available. But when it comes to the core and a little more need for, um, they don't have as much experience on the technical issues that their parents may have a little more au fait because of exposure. But I haven't noticed any difference around not wanting to talk about different topics in different ways. As far as their children, if they have them, they're focused more on education savings issues and setting up trust for them that may have some doubt when, you know, or annual gifts. But I don't see any real difference in how they interact with a planner, except for communication style. That's, that's my experience. Okay. Todd, anything you want to add? Yeah, a few things. Uh, we get a lot more text messages from folks in their 20s yeah. and 30s about questions than we do with our clients, uh, Mike, that are in their uh, 70s and 80s, if you will. Um, but focusing and in, in highlighting again the issue of relationships, as, as Mike had uh, previously referenced, that whether we're literally working with the next generation who is maybe 16 or 17, and as a sidebar note, ultra high net worth individuals, are they're very concerned about the level of wealth that they have and what the expectation is for the next generation. Are they going to be entrepreneurial or intrapreneurial? How are they going to find their happiness, if you will? So the method of communication has always been the same. Be open, honest, be true to yourself. Always do what you say you're going to do. Communicate um, as evidenced by the fact that I, I sit and present here today in a polo shirt because that's what I, this is how I dress every day. I have to be true to myself and not be somebody else that someone else would expect me to be. And we found um, that every generation from late teens to early 90s respects very open and honest communication, but slight variances to Cheryl's point um, with regard to how we communicate. Makes sense. Mike. Yeah. I see a somewhat striking distance from my perspective between the generations. The first being that the older generation, probably the, the impact of their parents, was not to talk about money. You didn't discuss money at, at, at the family table. You didn't discuss what would happen, how wealth might be transitioned. It was really kept quite, kind of tight. I think the younger generation is far more comfortable in talking about wealth and talking about money. It's not that little dirty thing that, that for generations we thought about. And so when I think of the role of the financial advisor, perhaps maybe the one thing they could get wrong, and I hope they don't, is that they approach this topic the way their clients might approach it, which is to bury it, to focus just on accumulation, work till I die, don't talk about this topic. It's a little too sensitive. I might be one child upset over the other child, to be a strong financial advisor, to be in the, the, the private wealth and trust industry as we are, those conversations are absolutely critical. And I actually think the children are better equipped to handle it than maybe some of the parents and grandparents would ever imagine. Interesting. Well, this, uh, this is a really nice transition because I wanted us to get into some of those mechanics of the family meetings that, that we talked about earlier. Um, because I think that is ultimately very important to one, one, one of the key things in this topic is how do advisors keep those children on uh, as clients and, and earn their trust, um, you know, moving, you know, into the next generation, you know, with, with this transfer of wealth. So, Cheryl, I'm going to start with you. How well do you know your clients, children and grandchildren? And, and how have you been able to develop those, situ those relationships? Yeah. So it varies by family and it varies by child. But, you know, some some children who are now adults, you know, I, I bought them their first baby book 
and now they're graduating from college and having their first jobs. <laughs> so I think the best way that we, so we know them very, very well. And I think the way we've developed the relationship, especially with people under 30, is to just have the door open because they're not going to be as interested in all things finance as their parents would like them to be nine, nine times out of a hundred, but they would like on demand questions answered. So, Oh, I got my first job. Here's my benefits package, which health insurance do I, you know, yes, I've had this Roth account forever, but I'm not really interested in how it's invested. And all of a sudden, Hey, can I buy NVIDIA in that account? So I think you have to be, let them know you're around, make introductions, make them feel comfortable. One of our goals is how do you work with an advisor, whether it's a tax advisor, a state advisor. So I think it's like opening the door of under 30 and making sure they know when they can walk in there, you're ready to respond to their questions. That's, that's what I have found has worked best in developing a relationship with them. But send them things along the way. When they get into college, send them a Christmas ornament for the Christmas tree on the college they got into, you know, an ornament based on the Gamecocks or Tech Clips and Tigers. Whatever it is, let them know you're out there till they're ready for you. Makes sense, Todd? Yeah, that South Carolina came out with that Gamecock reference there, <laughs> Cheryl, right? But I'm the Clemson go, Tigers, go so I have to go the other first. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, a few things. Um, we're fortunate and, and truly fortunate and blessed by the fact that, John, we, I, I think we have an excellent relationship um, with as many as four generations uh, in, in our profile of, of, client, of uh, you know, clients and families that we have the, the privilege of working with. Um, and it's, it's hard work. It, it's not too easy, but Sometimes um, you just have to put yourself out there on a limb, you know, and have those conversations, you know, kind of take a walk around the proverbial block to talk about uh, some difficult top topics that don't necessarily need to be negative, but but difficult to discuss. And um, we learn of uh, sometimes uh, children divorcing, some children that want to leave the family business. Um, it could be mother and father. Uh, or having marital difficulties and they don't want to because of stress within their own families. So we're truly uh, both um, honored and also uh, very careful with that, that trust that's been put in us to the extent that emotion really comes through with clients, right? They expect us to be able to give them financial and estate planning advice, but making the connection where they can feel by verification that we have them covered. And even if we don't agree on an issue, that will respectfully find some common ground to communicate about it. So um, again, fortunate because of the, the limited number of clients that we have uh, in working in a very specific niche industry. But I would say on a scale of one to 10, it's a solid 8.5 out of a 10, our relationship will up and down generation. That's great. And I'll just add on something that might be helpful to the audience, um, to what Todd says. We do have an advisor who is strictly dedicated to working with our children under 30. So that she can provide that on-demand service. She's in a different time zone, so she's not unhappy working at 8 o'clock at night when they can meet with her. You know, it's 5 o'clock for her. So we have found it's such a demand for that generation and for clients to serve their children that we've created a unique position just for delivering that advice and having that relationship. That's really interesting. M Mike, do you, uh, do you have thoughts on, I mean, what, 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 what Cheryl just described, do you have, uh, is, are, are there best practices there? Is there anything that you recommend to, to help yeah. with that sort of situation? Yeah, sure. Um, I agree with what Cheryl said. I think, you know, I think all of us know there are three fundamental planning phases uh, in a person's life, financial planning phases, the accumulation phase, when you're looking to build a nest egg, there's the preservation phase, when you're looking to live securely in retirement, and then there's the transition phase, which uh, is, happens to a, a smaller group of Americans that are in the financial position to do that. When you can integrate the transition phase into the preservation phase, the financial advisor, in its, by its nature, it involves the children. And if you think of those sequentially, you're missing a huge opportunity because you end up not talking about the transition phase until it actually happens, until there's a death, until a business is liquidated. And everyone knows once the business is liquidated, the assets go. The payment of a life insurance policy that goes to a child and immediately finds its way to another financial advisor or to Robinhood, for that matter, something in the, in the, on their phone. And so if you can 
bring the transition phase right at the center of your preservation conversations once your client moves into retirement. It makes this path that much easier. And it also allows you to guide it. So very simple, very tactical. And any client who has an estate or a trust has it codified. It's, it, it's not only codified in terms of what will happen to the assets when they when they uh, are paid out and where they go to the next generation or the causes they care about, but it's also codified to be enabled by the financial advisor. And so if a client has an estate plan, for a financial advisor to know that it's critical for them to opine on it, maybe perhaps bring in fiduciary and tax planning and estate planning and, uh, attorneys uh, into that conversation is absolutely essential to seek that We're in the middle of this relationship so that when the event does happen, when the wealth does transition, again, to the children or to these causes their, their clients care about deeply, the financial advisors at the beginning and all the theoretical things I may talk about today, the, the one tangible thing is if there's an estate plan, if there's a trust, financial advisor needs to be part of that and needs to see that in order to really effectively do their job. Otherwise, their clients will continue to get counsel and direction from their CPA or from their lawyers, and then the relationship starts to extend broader than just the financial advisor. So you can almost think of this from a defensive posture as well as a financial advisor. Mm -hmm. Get yourself at the table and bring experts in that automatically position you as someone with uh, great influence. Makes sense. Uh, Cheryl, how do you work with your clients to prepare their children and grandchildren for the future inheritance? Well, we do a variety of um, modules that families can engage in. And I think that families look just, first of all, around financial skills. Um, there's a great book by Jolene Godfrey about financial fitness for kids. And she says kids should have, and you think about it, adults too, skills in 10 areas. And those range from how to follow, how to create a follow a budget to how to change the world with your money. And so most clients are looking for us to help their clients develop those skills in the early stages. And then I think a secondary area is to be responsible around their wealth. How do they make good decisions around their wealth? So that's a secondary area, helping them with their money management all those kinds of, you know, sort of day to day, what the rest of us do when we're, you know, earning our own money, contributing to 401k. So I think that it's, it's really both a skills issue and the knowledge and good decision making skills that clients are looking for us to do. And we have a variety of modules that we use for that. And then I also think for more complex clients, well, how does a trust work? What's that even mean? Well, who's a trustee? What's a beneficiary? I mean, we can't suppose anything. Um, and how do I how do I tell my how do I have a conversation with my fiance about the family money? So it's all those kinds of issues that can arise that you want to be prepared for, not just off the cuff, but in a well-researched methodological, time-tested way of having those conversations. Um, so we we do a lot, a lot of that work. And so and it's great fun. It's great fun. <laughs> Sounds it. Um, you both, uh, you, you all talked about the, the, the value and the importance of family meetings. Um, I imagine a lot of preparation goes into that. Todd, I'm, I'm going to ask you first, uh, but, but certainly Cheryl, I, I want your thoughts as well. How, how do you prepare for those meetings? Uh, a few things. Number one, uh, we ask lots of questions ahead of time of um, mm -hmm. all generations. Who's going to be in the meeting uh, from a family standpoint? And at the end of the hour and a half, two and a half hours, what does success look like to them? Are there any items that are taboo not to talk about, which on occasion there are? And lastly, um, have the other stakeholders at the meeting that they can weigh in, showing them and proving that we're a team of advisors from attorneys to valuation analysts to CPAs, uh, trust officers, the list goes on that we're all available to be a resource to families. And then when we're finished with the meeting, and then we send everyone a summary email with follow-up points uh, where we need to uh, all weigh in by. So a uh, fairly simple process, just takes a lot of time and dedication to be able to run structure. Sure. Cheryl, I'm interested in what you do and also how often do you hold these meetings? 
Yeah, I, I think what Todd just described is absolutely best practices. And um, we typically, with family meetings, um, we, we you typically have them twice a year for more complex families. Some families, it's only once every three years. Some families, it is just, hey, you're 70, you're 75. How about having a child begin to come to a meeting? And they usually know which child they want. So it varies among families. The thing I would say, the only thing I would add to Todd's excellent outline is families typically want to tackle more than can actually happen in one meeting. And so be very sensitive how you chunk the information and keep an eye on everybody's energy and just say, hey, let's meet again in two weeks or a month or whatever, because especially when information is new, it can feel overwhelming and people just stop hearing and listening. And my third piece of advice on all of that is um, we do a lot of role playing here and I have the experience of being a family member in a role play and the pretend advisor kept talking and it felt like Charlie Brown's teacher. And I thought, oh, talk a lot less in a family meeting. Let them talk. You should be watching talk less than 20% of the time because they don't really want you talking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I can imagine. I can imagine that. Mike, um, for the uh, for, for the advisor looking at this, you know, from the from the standpoint of their business um, and, and the opportunity of growing their business and, and you know, and, and those that next generation as potential clients, how do they make the most of those meetings, um, you know, to to build those relationships? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of preparation that's involved. And when you get into the areas of trust, which you said earlier, which is a wonderful tool, mm -hmm. really codify the transition of assets and relationships, you need to project what the trust entails. You really need to simplify it for the family. Uh, our, for a company like ours in the private wealth space, you, your attorneys are all equipped at mapping out uh, flows so that it makes it very clear to the, the grantors, the parents, how assets will move uh, and when they will move, what will happen when assets get transitioned from one over the other. So it's almost, it's, it's really like a storybook. You're sitting there putting it on the paper. You're showing the, the, the family in very simplest terms possible why and how the assets will flow upon some certain event. I think that, that takes that complexity and greatly simplifies it. The other piece, and uh, I think Todd brought this up around uh, the, the trust officer, and we refer to them as these private wealth managers. Uh, they, their responsibility is to focus on the family uh, and to be there as an extension of the advisor's office, but to be a trusted partner with that family. And so they too need to come in. And so we train them on family meetings, but they need to help the advisor to get to the most critical points of those meetings in terms of what has to be known today and to show us point what maybe could be pushed off to another day. So it's not all crammed into one session, but it's taken us training. We had to go deep into it. Some comes very natural. There's an empathy component when you're talking about wealth transition, mm -hmm. believe it or not, even though these high dollar amounts that are sometimes ungodly, uh, there's a human element here, and it's this topic, as I said earlier, around death and what that means. And that's a, that's it can be uncomfortable for, for all parties, but it's so, so important. So to summarize it, sometimes a picture, even by the highest priced attorney in the room, can be worth a thousand words. Sure. Sure. All right. We are uh, getting close to the end of our time. I have a couple questions left that I want to get out. So uh, with that in mind, I'm, I'm going to go to Cheryl and then Todd with this next question. And then we'll have one last one for the three of you. Um, in your opinion, in your experience, what is the biggest impediment to getting that next generation or in some cases, two generations down the line to want to stay with you as the as their advisor, Cheryl, you, you first, and then Todd. I think the biggest obstacle, strangely enough, can still be geography. Many people want to be able to face to face time and wander in and know their whole client's team. I think the second thing is: Are you building an organization? like Mass Mutual has, and then Mike is representing, that can sustain a cross generation. So you have to put just as much development into your team, having all these skills we're talking about, so that when your client walks in the door, do they see their child being able to be supported by strong talent 30, 40, 50 years from now? So to me, that's the biggest obstacle clients want. Is a sustainable organization that's going to have the right people for my child, not just at this moment, but down the road? Sure. Todd? Uh, 
assuming that the next gen will naturally follow their path to maintaining a relationship with our firm, um, we're always curious, always communicating, making sure that we are earning that trust and the right to continue to maintain a relationship with the next gen as we have with previous gens. All right. Mike, uh, I'm going to go to you uh, for our, our final question. Um, what are what what do most advisors get wrong when it comes to navigating wealth transfer and and ultimately holding on to assets? I think number one is they they treat it as a sequential event. We help them accumulate wealth. We guide them through retirement, and then they wait for the event, which is often in this case a death. But as I said earlier. Uh, liquidation of a, a business to begin talking about transition. And if they can move that earlier, make that just integrated with the whole conversation of accumulation, the whole conversation around preservation, they will take, they will guide it. They will steer it right from the beginning and it'll sort of keep other types of advisors uh, out of the relationship in a healthy way. Um, and then I guess the other, the other piece would be just underestimating the complexity. This is complex things. These are complex assets. This is simple. Uh, and recognizing what you have and what you can get, how you can reach out and extend your capabilities as a financial advisor uh, to be able to provide your clients what they need in this moment. And so uh, don't give it up. But some of our greatest successes as a business are from advisors that are not even strong in this space because they recognize what they didn't know. And that's usually around the expertise piece. Todd, anything you want to add? No, um, not really. Just the, the importance of, of, of just maintaining those relationships and, and lines of communication. Um, it, a lot of it comes down to just lines of communication, right? It's it's like trying to define, you know, love or hope or, you know, prosperity. It means different things to different people. And uh, if we meet people where they are and they feel as though they're being heard and their needs are being met, they typically tend to stay around for a very, very, very long time. And also, as, as Cheryl and I, in summary, um, are the founding partners of our firms, it's also our responsibility to help shepherd those relationships to continue to our next generation for those of us that will uh, certainly take over for us. Absolutely. Cheryl? <laughs> Um, John, I would just add, I'll share what I think my biggest mistake over time has been is like to, to introduce a topic and then assume that's the final answer from the client and then something changes in their world and I don't reintroduce it. And, and so I think it's so easy to take a relationship as a static or a perspective as a static situation. And so I think with navigating wealth transfer, it is an ever evolving family system as well as an ever evolving regulatory system. And just reminding yourself to check in, to be naive about the situation from time to time. I wish I'd done that more often. Well, I think that is great advice from all three of you. And unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. Um, but I do want to uh, first take a moment to thank our partners at Mass Mutual uh, for sponsoring this webcast and, and helping us to, uh, to bring you the, this important conversation. Um, but then also, um, thanks to our panelists. Thank you so much, Mike, Cheryl, Todd. Really you, appreciate Todd. you guys. You know, taking the time, sharing your insights. Um, I, I, I think this was a great conversation that, that, that hopefully our audience got a whole lot out of. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it back to Pete now for some final notes. Um, but thank you so much to our audience for being with us today. And, and thanks to everybody. Pete. Thanks, John. And just echoing John's thanks to everyone for their involvement in the web in the, today's webcast, as well as the Mass Mutual for sponsoring our event. Uh, please check your in from email for information regarding our future webcast, as well for, for access to the recorded archive for this one. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your week.